My name is Carrie Neiman, and I'm an otologist at Johns Hopkins. When patients present with oral fullness and pressure, it can be challenging. We often look in their ears, and we see a normal exam. And we still diagnose them with eustachian tube dysfunction. And for too long, eustachian tube dysfunction has been this catch-all category as a diagnosis. But there are objective findings that we can look for on exams and in our testing to help us make a more confident diagnosis and set us on the right treatment path. First, we need to understand that eustachian tube dysfunction is actually a spectrum of disorders. We have from one side, the eustachian tube being too closed or obstructive eustachian tube dysfunction, to the other side of the spectrum where the eustachian tube is too open, patchless eustachian tube dysfunction. The tricky thing is that both of these can present with oral fullness and pressure. It's important that we then go back to our exam and our testing to be able to differentiate these two. There is a third type of eustachian tube dysfunction, barrow challenge eustachian tube dysfunction, that presents specifically with oral fullness and pressure with flights or changes in barometric pressure, things like scuba diving. In order to differentiate the type of eustachian tube dysfunction, we need to get a targeted history. So we want to understand when do they experience the oral fullness and pressure, what are things that make it better, what are things that make it worse, what treatments have they tried, and then other things like do they have accompanying symptoms, things like breath or voice autophony, which means do they hear their breathing or their voice kind of echoing inside their head at the same time that they have this oral fullness and pressure, and we also want to think about any other kind of underlying conditions that may put them at risk for the different types of eustachian tube dysfunction. So do they have any issues with allergies? Are they actively smoking, which may put them at risk for things like obstructive eustachian tube dysfunction? Or do they have a history of significant weight loss, things like a history of gastric bypass surgery, which we sometimes see with patchless eustachian tube dysfunction? When examining patients, a good otoscopic exam is important. We want to be able to understand, do we see any signs of effusion? Is there air fluid levels? How about any signs of retraction? Those are particularly important when we're thinking about obstructive eustachian tube dysfunction. If we think we have a patient who may have patchless eustachian tube dysfunction, there's a maneuver that we can go through in clinic that can help give us the diagnosis. So if you have a patient kind of sit upright in the exam chair, and while you're looking at their ear, go ahead and have them close the contralateral nostril and have them breathe in and out through that ipsilateral nostril. Because what you'll be looking for on that exam is you see movement of the ear drum back and forth in time with their breathing. So what you're looking for specifically, do you see medial and lateral excursions of the tympanic membrane with ipsilateral nasal breathing? And that really can be diagnostic of patchless eustachian tube dysfunction. Testing is another important part of making the diagnosis of eustachian tube dysfunction. A tympanogram is particularly important when we're thinking about obstructive eustachian tube dysfunction. So getting a tympanogram, which either shows a negative pressure, like a type C tympanogram, or fluid, like a type B tympanogram, can be diagnostic of obstructive eustachian tube dysfunction. If you're thinking about either obstructive or patchless or barrow challenge eustachian tube dysfunction, the other important part of this is to be able to do an exam of the structure and function of the eustachian tube. That can be done with either a flexible scope exam or a rigid scope exam, preferably with an angled scope, such as a 45 degree angled scope. And what you're looking for there is the opening and closing of the eustachian tube valve any kind of inflammation, any other structures that may be impeding the opening and closing of the eustachian tube, because there are characteristic findings that you can see on your exam that are consistent with either obstructive, barrow challenge, or patchless eustachian tube dysfunction. If patients present with oral fullness and they have no breath or voice autophony, they have a normal tympanogram, they have a normal exam, they have a normal eustachian tube exam, it's unlikely to be eustachian tube dysfunction. So we need to be thinking about what else can it be. And one of the most common causes of oral fullness and pressure when it's not eustachian tube dysfunction is temporomandibular disorders. So being able to do a really thorough exam of the TMJ or the temporomandibular joint and the associated musculature is important in helping boost your confidence in making that diagnosis. And that often entails doing a good intraoral bimanual exam of both the masseter and the pterygoid musculature to understand if there's any tension or tenderness. As more options for treatment and management of eustachian tube dysfunction emerge, things like balloon dilation of the eustachian tube, 
The ability to make an accurate diagnosis of eustachian tube dysfunction, and specifically the type of eustachian tube dysfunction, is critical in order to ensure the best treatment path and the best patient outcomes. Thank you.